Okay, perfect. few points before we get started today. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, participants are still rolling in, but I just wanted to say welcome to FORCE 2023. Um, if you aren't already a member of FORCE 11, please consider joining. Uh, membership to FORCE 11 is free. And then... On our next slide, we just want to thank all the volunteers that made this event possible and to our sponsors and funders for this year's conference. And then please make sure to visit the sketch for more information. Um, also be aware that there is a code of conduct that is available on the Force 11 website. Um, and also feel free to join the discussion on the Force 11 Slack. Um, I know that conversations and discussions after this panel can also continue there. And then lastly, I just want to highlight the Force 11 Scholarly Communication Institute. Um, you can find out more at the link on this slide. Um, and the most exciting thing to point out is that registration for that institute opens this week. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass it off to the panels, panelists who are going to introduce themselves today. Um, so feel free to share any slides that you have. Yeah, great. Thanks, Olivia. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Welcome to the session on implementing fair workflows, bringing researchers and solutions together. I'm Helena Kusain. I'm Data Sites Director of Community Engagement. Um, DataSide is involved in multiple FAIR-related projects, but I'm particularly excited about this one on implementing FAIR workflows. Um, the official title of the project that we'll be talking about today is Implementing FAIR Workflows, uh, a proof of concept study in the field of consciousness. Um, and the reason why I like this project so much is that it's not just us thinking about FAIR infrastructure and FAIR solutions, we're actually working with a team of researchers who are trying this all out in practice during their research workflows. Um, and um, it's not that we're trying to make the, fair, the, the, the workflows and the outputs fair after the research has been done. No, we were already thinking about the fair workflows before the first experiment was even conducted. So I think it's really great to to see how this works, to be thinking about fair workflows and implementing fair workflows along the way. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy that we have four really great speakers today. Um, we'll first hear from uh, the project lead, Xiaoli Chen. After that, we'll hear from the PhD student who's actually carrying out all the experiments and trying out all the fair workflows, Sifan Sang. Um, after that, uh, we'll have the scientific coordinator, Tanya Brown, and then our last speaker today is uh, Maria Pretzales, um, product manager at CDL, who represents one of the integration partners in this project. Um, we will start with the four talks and then there will be time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, you can, of course, already start putting questions in the chat and then uh, the speakers will be able to respond to those um, after the talks. So yeah, thanks so much for joining us today, and I hope we can have a great discussion at the end. Um, but I'll first hand over to Shali, uh, who will give an overview of the project. Thanks, Helena. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to uh, kick open this, this panel we have today. And uh, so I am the project lead, um, and uh, my talk is called uh, from global open infrastructure to local implementation to ping back to the theme of this conference. And uh, I think it's appropriate because we are that set as a infrastructure provider, we kind of look at things from really high level at all times. And in this project, we do really dive, we fly very close to the ground with the researcher and to see their day to day. Um, so I think this is great occasion and also to bring back a fair project to the to the fourth community and uh, this kind of the home home turf for all the fair conversations so um yeah and also just to mention we uh we are on the bird side and we are also on the elephant side and find us there um 
Yeah, so about the project itself, uh, it is a three year project uh, funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. Um, in the project, we aim to implement an exemplar fair and open workflow based on the reality of an entire research life cycle, where uh, in this uh, in the project, we set aside a partner with uh, a team of researchers at the Max Planck Institute for empirical aesthetics uh, that is um, uh, carrying out uh, so our researcher so fun uh, doing his entire PhD with this project. Uh, there are two studies involved uh, on neural data and on behavior data that he will uh, Following uh, my talk, he will give you a full overview of, uh, of his project, and uh, we also have a group of excellent uh, project partners uh, with us. Uh, aside from uh, California Digital Library, we have a representative uh, here, Maria, um, and we also have uh, ARDC, Australian Research Data Commons, bringing along the RAID uh, uh, project identifier, which you might have heard about in other occasions. And Dryad, the generic data repository, uh, Chronos Hub uh, is a uh, open access publishing uh, uh, assistant uh, aid platform, and CDAR is a um, metadata template uh, authoring platform, and also we have Crossref and the Center for Open Science uh, in the project as uh, in a capacity of project supporters. So we have really a uh, comprehensive cohort uh, that is working on this, um, this vision of uh, fair workflows throughout the project life cycle. So, um, so here are the main points that we are uh, we're capturing in the project. First is building the example of conducting research with fair practices using existing infrastructures. This is one of the keys uh, we want to hit is that the existing infrastructure is capable enough to support uh, most, if not all, of the uh, uh, research stages and research activities. And we want to see how it works out. And, uh, and also, we partner with tools and platforms to integrate DOI and metadata features to support certain workflows uh, like that's demanded in, the, in this uh, research life cycle. And also uh, through the pro a process, we share with the community our experience from the perspective of the researchers and paid integrators. And of course, uh, by the end of the project, we want to provide useful guides and uh, tools for researcher, funder, and pr uh, service providers to adopt fair supporting workflows in their uh, perspective, uh, you know, uh, operations and work, not just uh, research. So on the right hand side you see a diagram of the main chunks of the work. Um, so the research project itself obviously is an important part and the system integration um, is what we work with uh, work on with the project partners and we also uh, build a uh, domain specific metadata template with the researcher and uh, uh, throughout the project we organize trainings and workshops and appear on conferences to engage with communities like you. And uh, uh, we're also building this guides uh, for fair practices. And um, another main output from the project is a, a project-centric output dashboard that is based on the Dataside Commons interface. So um, to, uh, from the research uh, perspective, we want, what we want to do is to be fair from the start. And uh, if we talk about start, we have to map uh, the activities to project life cycle. We have to find the start and the end, which by itself is already quite a daunting task. Um, but for the sake of sanity, uh, <laughs> we all know that project, uh, research projects are never straightforward. But yeah, like I said, for the sake of sanity, we put together this very neat rainbow whale uh, representation of an entire project life cycle, starting from a grant application. And, uh, uh, and then when the grant is approved, we have uh, the stage two where the grant registered. And uh, following that, the research team uh, work on a data management plan uh, before the research actually starts. And then the research design with consideration in all sorts of 
uh, fair related activities. Following that, we find we are at the experiment uh, uh, stage uh, where uh, a researcher would author a registration sort of uh, a document. Um, and, uh, and then uh, when the code data and outputs are uh, coming out of the experiments, we talking about uh, sharing these in-frame outputs. And of course, uh, after uh, the results are in, we have the preprint stage, and then in the end, the research article publication stage. Um, this is just a representation. As I said, uh, we are uh, we are a year and a half into the project in the process. We also have feedback and from our experience that uh, uh, the process is not always uh, like this. There can be iterations in between, but uh, this is uh, before we find a better way to represent the process. This is uh, this is um, proved to be quite useful in this way. Um, so just as to map that concept to what's happening in the uh, research study. So this is a representation of the workflows that's happened, has happened and happening in the, in the first study. So with um, the first study, we have three investigators, uh, Zofan as a case student with two um, supervisors, um, PIs uh, from, uh, and this project is associated with two institutions uh, the Max Planck Institute and the Goethe University in Frankfurt. And um, uh, the investigators are identified with four kid IDs, and the, or, uh, the institutions are identified with four IDs. And throughout the, pro uh, the, the study, there are the, uh, the research project grant is um, assigned with a grant ID issued by Crossref, and the pre registration for uh, pilot experiments and many experiments. Um, they are all uh, shared, openly shared on OSF with uh, DOIs registered with them. Uh, and the data management plan in the, pro uh, in the study is uh, registered on, uh, is authored using the DMP pool and is issued with an DMP ID, which is a DOI. And um, uh, the, uh, analysis code and protocol and data is being processed on respective platforms not going one by one with it but uh, through the platform they will be issued the dois and uh, the preprint articles uh, the preprint will be submitted to sign archive um, and uh, and the article will be processed with um, uh, chronos hub as this uh, oa publishing um, platform all of these outputs will be issued with DOIs um, and uh, associated on the metadata level. Um, so, of, of course, uh, we think about this as quite straightforward in the uh, scholarly commu communication community. This all seems to be, you know, uh, no brainer. But when you actually put that into practice, there are much to discuss, and this is our experience. Past, past year and a half, we do have um, meet, uh, meetings, catch up with the research research team on a weekly basis to talk through the challenges they they um, uh, they encountered or questions they may have in these in carrying out all of these fair workflows. And uh, these on the slides are some of the topics that we have spent time to to work through, uh, like time management, we do have a process with the researcher to track the time that he spent on uh, these particular activities um, and uh, to, how to choose the right tools uh, with the constraints that the researcher have on a daily basis, how to navigate the data sharing policies, um, like how to deal with uh, domain-specific metadata, which is a quite a big topic on its own, especially for the researchers themselves. They are not um, pre-exposed to the conversations on metadata. And uh, licensing and ethics, um, because this is a neuroscience research project, these are particularly pertinent. Um, so this uh, experience and how we resolve these questions, how we discuss this, 
what we reflected in our researcher guide that we're that we're developing right now. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, the integration part. Uh, am I taking too long? I don't know. Please let me know if I'm rambling. Um, I was starting to think maybe another two minutes. Right. Sorry. Uh, I would be very fast. Uh, uh, so we do uh, focus on uh, system integration to make this fair process um, to be fair every step of the way. So I use this uh, diagram to show uh, we have existing services and the platforms that are supporting each of this stage. And uh, there were already uh, integrations between them. Um, but in the project, we are building new connections and uh, enhancing like existing connections to identify project uh, objects uh, outputs and creating new metadata like this annotation and annotating these uh, objects with new metadata and enrich existing metadata records and capturing these connections which will be the foundation of all of the this um, affair process that we uh, that we do and um, with all of these uh, integrations of course uh, we will take that to uh, to the layer two on this diagram, the pit graph, and uh, process that uh, so that they can be uh, called upon by the open APIs and uh, and in the end show up on a user interface that, um, that we can demonstrate and tell story with. And this is being developed uh, here at DataSite based on the DataSite Commons interface. And this is a mock-up of what a project on comments will look like where you can see accumulated statistics on um, project outputs and all of the related outputs and the researchers and their roles in the project will look like. So this is um, that's what this interface will look like. So we are very excited to show the, the final product when when project con uh, concludes. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Shelley. Um... Yeah, if you stop sharing your screen, then maybe Stefan can start sharing his. Yeah, there we go. Okay, thanks, Stefan. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Helena. Thank you, Jolie, for the beautiful introduction. So, do you see my slides in? Yeah, now it's full screen. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, today is my pleasure to present our FAIR research workflow and with FAIR domain specific metadata as the researcher in this open science project. So first I want to give the brief introduction to my PhD project. I'm working at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics under the supervision of Professor Lucia Maloney. And my PhD project is to work on the neural mechanism of consciousness is the question is basically, we have our brain and when we see a dog, how does our brain, the neurons in our brain represent the conscious experience of this dog? So in order to answer and understand better this question that has been long standing, we uh, conducted two projects. The first project is the online experiments. It's a behavior experiment. We will collect 1,400 344 subjects. And the second experiment is, is to bring the behavioral phenomena, behavioral paradigm in a project one into the MEG and record a neural activity while subjects uh, report, while subjects uh, uh, conduct our task. So as a researcher, before I joined my PhD, um, the traditional research workflow now is still on but existing traditional research workflow basically look like this. One researcher conducted one experiment, but they find no results, p-values larger than 0 0.05. And they conduct a second one and still no results. So we call it failed experiment. And the same for the third experiment. So what happened is that when they come to the fourth experiment, when they find a significant result, they will call it a successful experiment. What we do is that we just, uh, uh, write up the experiment four into the paper. And we dump all this data and the experiments that is, we call it failed experiment into our trash bin. And also uh, the data, the code uh, of our final experiment that really work also into the trash bin. We only describe this meta, this research output in the paper. 
but the only thing that is describable, described, open, citable, credible, and reusable is a paper. So, however, for researchers, as a researcher, if we want to establish a career in academia, the, the reason that we dump into the trash bin is because they, they are not creditable, reusable. So for researchers, this, uh, this, all these research outputs are actually trash, but for science, they are all gold. No results are also informative in science, but we just don't report them because they might not be interesting enough. So in order to avoid this situation, we are proposing a fair research workflow in which we are registering DOI for all the research outputs. And uh, we will publish and open all these research outputs along the whole research uh, life cycle, including the pre pilot experiments and the final experiment. And we will, so that all the research outputs will be described, openable, citable, credible, and reusable. We will register the UI for all these research outputs. And so in, the, in this way, the current the research outputs, the only after the very long research book, the only credible reusable research output is a paper. And scientists get credit by ordering the authorship. And all the scientists fight for the first author and the senior author, which is the most important thing. However, in our uh, fair workflow, when we deposit all these result power outputs and the registering DOI for all of them, we give the credits to the researchers that indeed conduct this research output, that indeed conduct the work that produce the research outputs so that we can have a fairer crediting process for each researchers rather than a simple research, uh, simple first author, senior author, second author, third author role that describe their contribution. And also in this way, by assigning the fairer, uh, 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 by, uh, by assigning each researcher to their specific research outputs that they have contributed to, the each researcher, they, their work is creditable, the actual time is costed, will be compensated by the crediting system. So now, given that we have all these research outputs and contributed by different researchers, it is good, but we still have a problem. That is when there are so many research outputs out there, we will, how could one easily find the research outputs so that people can reuse them only when it's reused, it is actually credited in the academic, academic career promotion system. Our solution is the rich metadata. So why do we need metadata? So the current practice, for example, when a researcher has the hypothesis and he cannot collect data, what he does is he think about, oh, now I have these research conditions that I need to have, but that my, I want the data that can have these research conditions and this task, this modality, and then they come to the ocean of paper and then they look into, okay, this paper didn't publish the data, this paper published the data, but most of the paper, uh, the, the data are not available, despite they're saying that the data is available upon reasonable request, but it's not available. So, but the ideal pro uh, practice is that when we have the hypothesis and we have the conditions in our mind, we can just go into the searching engine to search these conditions and we will immediately uh, uh, capture all these uh, corresponding data available for this analysis. So, that's why when we have rich metadata of all the data sets, we can't do this. So without, uh, so in our uh, fair workflow work project, we are also therefore building the metadata templates for human cognitive neuroscience data. And we start from the general uh, metadata template of the experiment setup and event structure. And we select some items and uh, in the hybrid workshop with the scientists in our group, and also we can have one on one interview in the with the scientists in our research institute and we also conduct online feedback from our advisory board and we come to the current version of a metadata template and our metadata template including the following the first module of the metadata template is the data set the data sets including the data modality data acquisition technique and also whether data is pre-processed or not what is the data standard that's going to be applied to uh, the data and the source data set and also we include the crediting and acknowledgement information 
who is a contributor and their orchid, the contributor role and the related project. And also the experimental conditions. So for example, what is the area of research? Whether it's critical to, and uh, the ethic information, for example, the ethic approval number and the paradigm, experimental paradigm that is conducted and the subjects information that is collected in the experiments and also the analysis that is conducted to analyze the existing data set. A lot of these items are actually uh, supported by existing ontologies so that this information are machine readable. So in this way, when we publish so many, when in this way, when we can re reproduce so many research outputs, and at the same time, they are accompanied published with rich metadata, in the end, we'll come to the rich science. And thanks to my supervisor and the collaborators, scientific collaborators and the supervisors, and my open science collaborators, uh, this is also their beautiful work. Thank you. Thanks, Safan. That was really great. Um, okay, I think then we can move to Tanya for another research perspective. Thanks, Helena. Uh, and you can see my slides okay? Yeah, great. The full thank screen. You. Okay. So I'm here today to showcase a practical example of the implementation of FAIR workflows uh, for our consortium project known as Cogitate. Uh, so I'm joining you from Frankfurt, Germany, where I'm the scientific project manager of Cogitate at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics. Um, so just to start with a, br a brief overview of what I'll go through today. Uh, so I'll give you an overview of what Cogitate actually is, so building the foundation. I'll present the problem being the main challenges we uh, face as a large-scale consortium. Um, and then talk about a little, a little bit about the solution and how we see fair workflows um, will help towards the, the major challenges that we face. Um, so just start with a brief overview of Cogitate to familiarize you with our project. Uh, Cogitate is a large scale open science consortium that was formed in 2019 to tackle the hard problem of consciousness by way of a pre-registered adversarial collaboration. Uh, and it arbitrates between two leading theories of consciousness. We're made up of 12 different um, research institutions. Um, and we span three continents and a 17 hour time difference. Um, and we're supported by a four year Templeton World Charity Foundation grant. Uh, but we have one shared vision uh, towards making a significant process or progress in the uh, understanding of the neural correlates of consciousness. Uh, in its entirety, the Cogitate project is guided by a robust set of guiding principles that encapsulates fair and open science and a robust approach to moving the, the dial towards an updated way of conducting uh, scientific research. And we do that through an approach of team science, meaning we have a large team of diverse international and multidisciplinary people uh, with an assortment of proficiencies, um, but we all come together uh, with a mixture of motivations and expectations. And I'll talk a little bit about this later on and how that plays out. Um, we are a pre-registered uh, project and we have a multimodal neuroimaging data set. Uh, we use a standardized experimental protocols uh, that will ultimately be released along with the data that we share and the code that we share. Uh, and we also have a built-in replication process um, in, in the experimental paradigms and analyses. Uh, and with that, this are some of the majority of the members. I think a few people have come and gone since, uh, but this is the team that we uh, call the core con uh, Cogitate Consortium. Uh, so I think we're all here today because we all have a shared value towards being fair. And certainly we all understand that fair doesn't just happen. It requires hard work and time and resources and a lot of know-how. Um, and specifically, some of the challenges that are imposed by being fair, uh, specifically in a large scale consortium, um, is that we are one of many. So in such a large group, there's a sense that one can get lost in the shuffle, and it's difficult to differentiate oneself. Uh, so for our main paper, for example, uh, the students have been earmarked as being the first author, but current publication norms don't really offer a good way of translating this. And I'll point exactly what I mean by this in a couple of slides. There's also much nuance that gets lost um, with respect to one's contributions. So in practice, we all have experience at one time or another, I'm sure, some sort of or some level of inequity uh, in contributions, but this may not have been translated in accordance with current reporting standards. 
And lastly, how do we know that we're doing good fair science? And how do we differentiate the good fair science from the rest? Um, so here in a publication that was put out by the International Brain Lab, um, where they listed the authors um, again, uh, across the x-axis here, um, and then the various taxonomy or credit taxonomies across the y-axis. And then they've assigned contributions in accordance to a color code um, representing percent effort with the darkest being the most effort, or these are the leads on the project, and then the lightest being some uh, level of minor effort or a supporting role. But in our perspective, this still comes out short, uh, still comes up short, where uh, more work doesn't necessarily equate to better, um, it simply means more. Uh, this method still lacks the necessi uh, necessary granularity to achieve really a useful uh, measure of impact per se, a hiring committee to assess um, one's contributions. Um, or take a recent paper that we published in FOSS One, uh, where we had 25 authors, um, and we also employed this contribution matrix or some um, a similar iteration of what they used at the IBL. But in practice, uh, how will it ultimately be cited? Probably something like this. So again, uh, this is where the nuance really gets lost. Uh, and this leaves many researchers asking, is being fair really worth my time, my effort, and my resources? Um, and that's where we say, uh, perhaps Fair Workflows is here to, to help us with all of this. Um, so for us, the development of the Fair Workflows will provide us with the ability to uh, visualize the diversity of our research output and increase the valuation of sharing beyond just our papers. Uh, it will indicate the availability and connectedness of our outputs by facilitating reuse, uh, by lowering the barrier for discovery and acquisition, uh, and enhance the reproducibility by providing contextual information. Uh, it will help us track our impact and our credits, uh, and this supports effective reporting and evaluation. And finally, uh, provides a means for reporting our research activities, outputs, or contributions. Um, yeah. So uh, now I'll take you a walk through a, simple, a simplified summary of exactly how this will play out. Uh, if we take the anticipated outputs of Cogitate, uh, which of course will all be done or executed in accordance with fair open science principles, whereby our data and code are shared, our publications are in open access journals, so on and so forth. Uh, and then we, all, we assign them all a DOI. Uh, and then we link them through PIDs, we get our FAIR workflow. And then we'll be able to show this either on a project basis, uh, also on a per person basis, um, or as a project in relation to other projects or people within uh, the community. And if we take a use case, so here I'm taking one of our postdocs um, that's traversing into the job market. So the main challenge uh, for him being that uh, there, um, he's just one of many in a large scale consortium and he's going to have limited publications because of the way that our consortium is structured. Uh, we have set number of papers that will come out in accordance with our grant milestones. Um, and the student will um, also be amongst a, a pool of other, um, other candidates that likely have more publications than him, um, as well as having the traditional research mindset that still exists, uh, whereby publications are really uh, key for uh, hiring metrics. So what the FAIR workflows we, or we envision will give this student um, is a dashboard where they can ask, what is the impact of my science? Uh, how many people have published with my data or my code or used my protocols or cited my papers? Um, and this, now they're able to compare this job candidate with others in a more quantifiable and qualitative way. Um, and then let's take a second use case, being more senior scientist that participates in many open science initiatives. And let's say they're being asked by their employer um, and or on a grant application to demonstrate their scientific contributions. So now this researcher would be able to generate a comprehensive summary of their work and their impact with a level of granularity beyond simply listing publications or an age index and successful grants. And this is making it more meaningful uh, for the person seeking such information, especially when compared to the current status quo. 
And lastly, let's take an example of, um, of a large scale project, one that I was formerly involved with. This is the Virtual Brain, which is an open science or open source software platform um, that was developed uh, in 2012. And it currently has more than 40,000 downloads. Um, so beyond the disparate team that works directly on the project, uh, the usership has obviously exponentially grown with over 40,000 users. Uh, but currently there's no good way of getting a snapshot of TVB's true impact in its entirety. So this fair workflow dashboard would uh, corrugate all the TVB related DOIs and provide insights into TVB's um, incredible and credible uh, impact in the neuroscience field. So altogether, uh, this project will strengthen the central position of PIDs uh, in research management, uh, generate new benchmarks for best practices for being fair um, by way of uh, paving the way for community buy-in, provide an alternative method um, through a, a comprehensive dashboard um, and give credit where credit is due. And with that, I just wanted to acknowledge my, my colleagues that have worked with us on this project, um, many of them here today, uh, and thank you. And I will leave it there and, and pass it over to Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Okay, now we move to our last speaker of today's session, Maria. All righty. Amazing. Just want to make sure you all can see my slide. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it looks good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to talk about one um, one piece of the FAIR workflow um, that we are working on through this project, and that is the data management plan. We'll talk about how we are streamlining uh, data management with the use of persistent identifiers. Uh, so my name is Maria Pinsos, and I am with the California Digital Library. I work in research data management. Um, one of the big uh, services that I run um, as part of my work is the DMP tool. And I know many folks are already familiar with the DMP tool. I saw many familiar names on the list here. Um, but for those who might be new, uh, we are a free open source platform for the creation of data management plans. So we have templates for all of the U.S. federal funders as well as private foundations. We have some international funders as well. Um, but we have gotten very big uh, lately, particularly with new um, NIH requirements around creating data management plans. So we now have over 377 institutions utilizing uh, the DMP tool worldwide. Uh, so a lot of our work um, in the past few years in terms of technical development has really centered around developing gain actionable management plans. So DMPs are still just static documents that you send to your funder. It's a PDF file. It describes what you're going to do in terms of data management for your research. Usually it's two pages, just static text. So what we've been doing is structuring that information so that we can exchange all that rich information about research in an interoperable structured manner. Um, the reason that's important, I think we know, is that there's a lot of really rich information about research contained in data management plans that can be used to help facilitate good guidance for institutions to ensure compliance, this comes up increasingly um, lately with more federal requirements around data sharing. Um, kind of like what uh, Tanya and Zephan were talking about in terms of promoting research integrity, giving people credit for being good data stewards, and importantly, tracking impact. So that can help grant administrators, university folks track the impact of an organization's research programs over time. It can also help researchers track their own, the own impact of their research over time as well. So our approach um, at CDL really is to combine machine actionable DMP, so structured data management plans with PID enabled infrastructure. So we're not just structuring DMPs, we're also giving the DMP a persistent identifier. We're using PIDs within the DMP. And the reason that's important is because we're built on an existing ecosystem. We're built on existing open infrastructure. We don't have to build a whole new kind of siloed system. We're sharing it openly so that other systems can consume this information in an open way. This is not dependent on the DMP tool or any particular system. This approach is built explicitly 
to be open and interoperable so that anybody could pick up this metadata and build their own system um, and expose these relationships between scholarly outputs in an open and interoperable manner. So within the DMP tool, um, we have a few features that we've uh, released recently that we've been kind of piloting out with the Fair Workflows project. Um, and that includes the ability to link plans to output so that we're able to make those connections that Tanya and Zifan were talking about um, between um, uh, a project and between the articles it produces or the preprints or the software or the protocol, anything essentially with a persistent identifier, we can connect those through the use of related identifiers. Um, so within the DMP, uh, we use controlled vocabularies wherever possible. We use the credit taxonomy to make sure people get the appropriate credit for their work regarding data management. Um, and we use things like ROARs, um, funder registry IDs, ORCIDs, um, RE3 data for repositories, and of course, a persistent identifier specifically for the data management plan. So then once we kind of have that structured DMP and we have a DMP ID, we can take that kind of uh, core anchor PID and we can connect it by using connections to existing external APIs, APIs from funders. This is really what we're focusing on right now. We're focusing on the NIH uh, awards API and the NSF awards API and seeing what information can we get about research to automatically feed into that DMP ID so that we can make connections between scholarly works. But there's other systems um, as well, like publishers, repositories, internal systems. So gathering all this information, updating the data management plan, and then like what um, Jali and I think Tanya as well talking about this dashboard so that we're able to get all this good information, this rich information about research, display it on a dashboard so that a institution or a researcher has a view into what's going on at their institution, or if you're looking at a project, all of the sort of different outputs that were produced as part of that work. So a lot of what's driving um, our work specifically is um, new federal mandates. Um, so we have uh, in the US, we have the new federal mandate from NIH, many more coming down the road around requiring um, data sharing. So institutions are looking at how can they demonstrate and track compliance with these new data sharing requirements. So what we're doing is trying to build on, as I said, build on this existing community-driven open infrastructure so that we can build fair workflows um, to track research outputs from the project inception. So from that planning phase that I was talking about, all the way through to long-term preservation deposit into a preservation system or data repository and looking at reuse, of course, as well. So just a super simplified um, view into how our approach can be structured. There's lots of different use cases, but I didn't wanna to take too much time. So I'm just looking at one very simplified. So this is from the PI um, perspective. So these are five steps. Um, first one, obviously you create your DMP. Within that, you're including ORCIDs um, for all PIs. You're also, it's automatically capturing other um, persistent identifiers in the process. The researcher downloads their DMP, submits it to whatever funder they're working with, generates a persistent identifier. Those are the four key steps that sort of rely on the researcher to do. After that, this is what we're working on right now. We are pinging all of the available APIs. So awards APIs, data repositories, publishers, internal systems to automatically feed information and keep that DMP updated over time. Um, so that is what I've got. Um, if you're interested in learning more, just a few links. And I think we have time for questions. I will turn it back to Helena um, now. Yeah, thanks, Maria. And thanks again also to Shelley, Sivan, and Tanya. I think that was all really interesting. So uh, I'm also really happy we still have sort of 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A for a panel discussion. Um, so I think this is actually a Zoom meeting, so probably people are also able to speak. Uh, so yeah, if you have questions or comments or thoughts or anything you want to share, 
Uh, you can either put it in the chat or you can raise your hand and then unmute and share your thoughts with us. Um, yeah, I think I already saw a first question in the chat and I know Tanya, you just uh, typed a whole response, but um, Todd was asking in your exploration, exploration of the use of the credit taxonomy, were there ways that you thought the structure might be improved? Um, so yeah, maybe you briefly want to comment on that here as well. You need a second. <laughs> Ah, you can't unmute yourself. Ah, oh, okay. I now asked you to unmute. Did that do anything? Yes. That, oh, that, that, that okay. allowed me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I just was responding in terms of um, the, the, the question was how to improve the taxonomy. Um, I think the taxonomy is really useful and I think it gives a really a, a, a good guidance for um, typical research projects, but what we're facing with ours is because we have so many subgroups doing the same activity, but the way that the same activity gets recapitulated across sites is very different. Um, so I gave one example, but maybe just to kind of define that um, more, more deeply was the, so out of the neuroimaging modalities that we're collecting, um, for instance, there's IEG, MEG, and fMRI. To collect IEG data is a lot different than collecting MEG data or fMRI data. So if we were to use the, the current taxonomy um, and saying, you know, this person collected data or this person was involved um, in the data acquisition, um, that's going to actually play out very differently for somebody who did IAV or somebody that did fMRI or somebody that did MEG. Um, and we would like to be able to credit the, the, the researchers accordingly, um, being that it takes more time and more uh, skill to do, to do one or the other. So those, that, that's sort of the contextual information that we really find, is, find gets lost when you're talking about these kind of large scale consortium level projects where you have a lot of people doing the same thing. Okay, great, thanks. Todd, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, I actually had a question uh, for Sifan, so let me ask that, uh, because I know, Sifan, that you also uh, do some time tracking to actually try to find out uh, how much time it takes you to implement fairer research workflows. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you maybe wanted to comment on how you're doing that time tracking and what you're seeing so far and what that means. Ah, I always have to ask people to unmute apparently. Okay, there you go. Yes, thank you, Helena, for providing such a nice question. Um, it's indeed like for most of the researchers that are the it, but for most of the research in academia, the biggest concern when they conduct this fair or open practice is the time that they need to produce these outputs, which are completely extra time. That's uh, uh, because the most of research outputs, for example, data or code, are not really properly credited in our system. So the, for them, it's completely a waste of time. And in my PhD, currently, we are indeed collecting. We are, for example, because we have so many different risk type of research outputs from data, for registration, DMP, protocol. So we are collecting on the weekly basis, the hours that I have spent in the past one week on any of the research outputs that are not really included in the traditional research workflow. And currently, uh, I would like to show you the data of our time checking, but however, the first project is not done yet, so some of the research output is not even haven't even since they started to be produced. So I would like to share you the data of the full research workflow when the first project is uh, is uh, is finished. So currently, in my PhD, even though I'm, for example, um, uh, producing and also publishing the a lot of research outputs even for the pilot experiments. But so far, is I'm spending roughly only around 10% of my full, uh, full research time on these uh, open practices. So as uh, current like PhD student who is experiencing this, this time, 
uh, cost is very limited. And uh, considering the potential scientific contribution and uh, scientific impact, this 10% is very, um, is very worth it. And especially in the future when they are indeed being credited and when they are indeed being um, recited and reused, reused um, this time, uh, these time costs will be just ignorable. And I so I'm very optimistic so far. And, and I would like to show you all of you at the later phase when we are at a better, better position to show the time tracking data. So next year presentation on time tracking data. Yes. And do you do you feel you're able to distinguish between sort of the time it takes to figure out the fair workflows in the context of this project and then the time it takes to actually apply the fair workflows? Because I guess for other researchers it would be just the application part and not the inventing the, the workflow part. Yes. So at the early stage of the time tracking, we are actually considering both. But uh, I also completely agree with you, and this is also our current practice that we are only calculating the time cost for the research outputs that are only uh, that are only will lead to the future adopters of our field research workflows, the the relevant ones. Yes. Thanks. I see a, a difficult question in the chat. Not sure who wants to take this. Um, what barriers might exist in institutional mindsets regarding what is creditable? If we implemented fair workflows as described here, do we think decision makers would shift or remain committed to the traditional metrics? So who wants to comment on that first? Um, I might can start with this question. So I think this is the, so first this, this will cost a very, very long time. And uh, the whole, it has to be uh, widely adopted by many institutions and many researchers. And uh, one uh, significant uh, proportion of researchers are actually sharing their research outputs apart from the paper. And also it becomes the common practice to cite this individual research outputs rather than only the paper always, I can see a better, uh, I can see the potential institutional change. And uh, here in our project, we, uh, our, our project is just to, as the um, example, or uh, as an example to show that this process is doable. And I indeed, this is, this will be the, in my opinion, this will be a long process. Tanya, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, well, I share Zafan's um, realistic view. <laughs> um, you know, I would try to be optimistic about these things, and I would like a perfect world where, or I could say that my perfect world would be uh, that we could shift away from these more traditional metrics and start looking at research in the way that it's actually practiced today, um, being that there's all of these other outputs and efforts that uh, go into making science possible. Um, so I think it's also projects such as this one um, that will start to sh shift that dial. Um, and I think the more that we um, participate in discussion and more projects such as this start popping up to make it easier for people to showcase their work in this way, um, we can start to bid bridge that gap between uh, where we currently are and where I think we would all like to be when it comes to open and fair research. Great, thanks, uh, Zivan and Tanya. Shali, I believe you received a question about use of Code Ocean. Uh, yes. So yeah, I I just wanted to uh, say Code Ocean is quite impressive. Uh, that was one of the uh, on our radar quite uh, early in the project, and uh, we did a small. Uh, kind of benchmark analysis on different types of uh, ana analytic platforms that is provided out there. And I, I believe Code Ocean is uh, also issuing that as IDOI. So yeah. we really like that. Um, and uh, it, it's so especially, so uh, we have commercial partners that work together with us on these uh, open scholarly infrastructure um, kind of endeavor. Um, so so yeah, I think I think the only reason we we 
we did not have a, a kind of analytic platform uh, installed in the project processes. Uh, we didn't have um, uh, want the, the project to the team to change their workflow like very dramatically, and uh, um, uh, so so this type of uh, change in workflow is quite a uh, need kind of a you know a, like a learning curve and um, but what was called ocean percent is like very valuable from what we see here um, yeah, and i th i think also the, the uh, sorry <laughs> to, to that yeah. initially but i think the idea is also that the way we're developing the workflows is that as long as there are persistent identifiers registered with connection metadata that can be through any platform i mean we're just working with a number of platforms as an example to show what the workflow can look like but anything can be plugged into that as long as it's connected through persistent identifiers and metadata um yeah maybe we move to the last question because i know people maybe also need a minute to move to the next session so there's a question for maria i guess maria i need to ask you to unmute as well with DMPs, are there plans to include domain specific metadata and how would you see discovery platforms using this? Yeah, I love this question. Thank you. Um, so the way we're doing this right now is we're building the ability to customize templates on specific fields so that um, an administrator could go in and add domain specific controlled vocabularies to a template. Um, the way the DMP tool is built, we don't write our own, for the most part, we don't create our own data management plan forms, we're taking them straight from the funders. So if the funder has controlled metadata template or controlled metadata elements, we use those. Um, but we are adding this ability so that administrators can go in and define their own set of metadata elements and they could make their own set of domain specific metadata in terms of standards and in terms of data types and formats. Um, so that's a big change. Uh, we're actually building it right now and I think it should be released um, in the next few weeks. Um, I was gonna say one other thing, I forgot. So anyway, uh, in terms of how I, oh, I remember, we're also working with CEDAR as part of this project, the Fair Workflows project, and that will include um, a do some domain-specific metadata from coming from the CEDAR um, metadata uh, workbench into the DMP tool, but that's just for this project as kind of like a prototype of how we could work and add more domain-specific metadata. As far as how discovery platforms could use this information, this would be like an integration with um, probably like a data repository, such as like a dryad, where they could consume um, basic information about um, research outputs, and that could help inform what they put in when they're ready to deposit their data. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, well then, let me thank the four speakers again, and also Thanks to all of you who joined today and uh, and asked questions. I don't know, Olivia, I see you already put a message in chat. Do you briefly want to say something about how people can join the next session? Yeah, um, so I put in the chat links to the next session, which is our second keynote for today. Um, so feel free to use those links to join the next session. Um, and if you guys want to continue the conversation, we do have that Slack channel um, there for you. But thank you all. This was really great. Um, great questions. And yeah, definitely excited to continue the conference. Great. Thanks, everyone.